Uh, I'll introduce him very briefly. He is now working at the University of Lancaster in the uh, UK, and uh, the first presentation will be on physical health and quality of medical care for people with schizophrenia. And then he will uh, tell us about cardiac metabolic risk in schizophrenia. Please, Alex, and thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invitation, <laughs> and thanks for joining me here. I really want to try and put physical health on the map today, but particularly taking the perspective of psychiatrists and GPs and colleagues in general medicine. Each professional group has its own responsibility, and only by discharging that responsibility properly are we going to make inroads into this very difficult area. A little bit of orientation for you. What I'm going to be talking about in this part of the talk are essentially care inequalities. That is disparities based on the fact that somebody has a mental ill health condition and essentially no other factor. So another way of looking at this is does somebody come across less quality or less frequent care in either a medical or psychiatric domain just by virtue of their condition? If that was the case, we would have a pretty serious disparity which we need to correct. And just for a heads up, the bit that you're probably really wanting me to get to is this section four, which is how well are we doing our job monitoring the patients as psychiatrists for metabolic components. Section four overlaps between the two talks. Now, a question for the audience here. Given that this talk is a lot really about attitudes and beliefs about whether physical health is a problem. How many people in the audience are regularly monitoring their own patients for physical health concerns? Hands up if you're regularly monitoring patients for physical health concerns. So the majority. Hands up if you're monitoring patients to your satisfaction, meaning that you're content that their physical health concerns are being recognized and addressed. Are, you, are those that put their hand up there, are you content that you're doing as good a job as possible? Can I see a show of hands for those that are content with doing as good a job as possible in this area? Just one or two hands. <laughs> well, let me show you. A new survey has just come out. Um, it's actually in the journal PLOS ONE, and Shigara is the first author. This is December 2013. And essentially, this is the largest study of attitudes from psychiatrists on medical monitoring. And in 2005, 2,500 completed surveys, 80% answered positively to my first question, who's monitoring at all? 80% said they agree it's a problem and they're doing some monitoring. But only 20% answered positively to my second question, they're monitoring satisfactory. And if we look at the shared sister literature, if you like, on GP's attitudes, you'll find that GPs are equally unsure about this. So giving this whole problem to GPs, that's primary care physicians in the US, and hoping they'll do all the physical health care, as is suggested in some documents, in my opinion is a dangerous strategy. I don't think we can just give this problem to GPs to solve. Now, I'm not standing here today and pretending that my practice is perfect. In fact, this is a national survey of monitoring standards across the whole of the UK. And each one of these bars is a different hospital. And I have to tell you, my hospital is scoring at the very, very low end of compliance with physical health monitoring. In other words, I'm standing here in front of you today saying myself and my colleagues are guilty in many ways of not monitoring to the ideal degree. We, we need to improve. In fact, it's got so serious locally that the CQC, who are the hospital inspectors in the UK, have given my trust a health warning because of poor physical health monitoring. And I wrote to my hospital saying, this is a serious concern, I want to help you address this. They nominated the chief nurse to take care of this problem. I wrote to the chief nurse about this problem. The chief nurse didn't respi reply to me. I wrote again, he didn't reply to me again. I wrote a third time. He said, good luck with this problem. Good luck with this problem. There's an attitude problem out there, and we're guilty of it. And I, what I'm trying to do today is to try and influence that attitude in the audience here so we can all say, look, we're probably all a little bit guilty of less than ideal monitoring. Let's see what we need to do. What are the headline areas? Now, 
Why is this so important? It's important because of mortality. Let's put it very simply. You must have seen in the literature over the last five to ten years the increased mortality in schizophrenia and related disorders. And one of the largest studies has come from Gale in um, archives, which is now JAMA Psychiatry. And they track the relative risk of one million, um, I believe it was Swedish conscripts, who were followed following discharge from the army, born between 1951 and 1978. And across multiple disorders, including schizophrenia, but not limited to schizophrenia, we've got bipolar disorder, substance misuse, there was a high relative risk of mortality, which really did not decline substantially with time. To put that in everyday terms for you, there's a mortality gap which is roughly 14 years, 14 years for a patient with schizophrenia. In fact, it's more for those with a substance misuse. And if you want to look this paper up, it's from Westman, and it's actually the Finnish data, although there's parallel data from um, Denmark, which is also, also equally, equally um, powerful in terms of sample size. So we've got a mortality gap. And that mortality gap is approximately the same as the mortality gap uh, that you find in diabetes, it's the same that you find in heart disease, and it's actually the same as you find in cancer, which is quite remarkable. If you think about that for a second, the mortality gap in schizophrenia, which is the years of premature life lost, is the same number of years lost if you're diagnosed with cancer. And the reason it's the same is because clearly the aggression of the disease on mortality is not the same, but schizophrenia begins early, whereas cancer begins late. So the cumulative effect is broadly the same in terms of years of life lost. And that's somewhere between 13 and 17 years of life lost. Now we've been taught for a long time that suicide is the major problem underlying this uh, this concern. And perhaps ECG abnormalities. I've written a paper myself on the importance of ECG abnormalities. But this is not correct. Suicide is important. I'm not denying suicide is important, but it's a contributory factor that contributes about 13% of the overall mortality, the overall premature mortality. So 80% or more is contributed to by so-called natural deaths. In other words, cardiovascular disease, metabolic problems, the things we're talking about in terms of risk factors today. That's where most of the premature mortality comes from. Yes, we do need to address suicide, but a much greater proportion of premature deaths is coming from multiple conditions. This is just one study showing that 13% is explained by suicide. So what is the explanation overall for this premature mortality? The difficulty is it's not one factor that we have to address here. It's multiple factors. And we've got the risk factors which are the subject of the next talk, which you can read on the left-hand side. But we've got this topic for today, which I think perhaps, some, this, perhaps this topic is new to some of you. So what I'm going to talk about in some detail is, is, it, is, is there evidence in the literature that our patients are getting less than adequate medical or psychiatric care in terms of medical monitoring? So medical monitoring by psychiatrists, GPs, or by um, medical colleagues in internal medicine and other specialties. And if this is the case, then this is a headline. This is really a headline. Because if it's the case, then these care inequalities are then mostly atrogenic and they are mostly reversible. It's something we should definitely be doing something about. So this is the orientation slide. So let's quickly go through these one by one. So is there evidence then that just by virtue of having schizophrenia, you receive less mass screening procedures? So let's choose one headline procedure. Let's choose mammography. So we've done a meta-analysis, it's just submitted actually, this meta-analysis on mammography in patients with and without mental illness. But within that we have the data on schizophrenia and SMI. And the headline is, in terms of odds ratios, if you have any mental illness across 29 studies, you have an odds of receiving um, timely mammography within the same period, which is usually tracked every year or every two years, of uh, 0.071, and it's statistically significant. But look at this, if you have SMI or schizophrenia, then your odds ratio for mammography, just by virtue of having that diagnosis of schizophrenia, is 0.54. And what that translates to in the UK is 45,000 missed screens by virtue of having schizophrenia. And if you translate that into um, implications for mortality, it adds up to 90 unnecessary breast cancer deaths. 
Now with the population of the USA and the number of screens there, which is approximately 20 million mammographies per year, then it adds up to half a million missed mammographies on account of mental illness. And that's 1,000 unnecessary deaths just by virtue of the diagnosed mental ill health condition. Now that's mass screening. There are other examples, but mammography is the one that's best described, and it's the one where the data has enabled a meta-analysis. Is, this, is there equivalent data in diagnostic delays? Well, I'm looking here for head-to-head -head data. Can we look at the diagnosis of um, patients with a mental health concern, let's say in one setting, compared to the diagnosis of an you know, equivalent physical health concern. Now, I haven't found a paper in schizophrenia that does that, but I have found the elucidation of a symptom, and that symptom, head-to-head, -head, is distress versus pain. And this is a paper by Paul Jacobson in the Psycho-Oncology Journal, 2011. Each one of these bars is a Florida cancer centre, and the total number of patients studied is 1,600. And what you find if you... I'll give you the headline message... They looked at how often were nurses attending to and notating emotional distress as opposed to attending to and notating in the medical records pain. Only on 52% of occasions did the nurses attend to distress, but on 80% of occasions the nurses attended to pain. Now we need an equivalent study like that head to head with the headline of a diagnosable mental disorder. There's plenty of poor recognition studies. We've reviewed a lot of those ourselves in our group, but not head-to-head -head against the medical condition. And this is head-to-head, -head, one symptom against another. What about physical examination? Well, here I don't have a comparative data, but I do have the data on how often we are physically examining our patients. And I suspect if I asked you, how often are you on your unit, you and your colleagues, physically examining your patients when they're admitted? Everyone would say yes, because everyone claims they are. But actually, when you go to the notes, it's surprising how often it's not done. And the definitive study, it's not, it's not a huge study, the sample size only 229, but uh, Giuliano Bobbins, who's been at this conference, um, has presented, um, 229 psychiatrists I should say, has presented this data in a previous a conference, but this is based on um, a paper that's come out in, I think it's psychiatric research, and in any case, the result here, if you look up to physical examination, is across inpatients and outpatients, only 40% of the patients had a recorded um, physical examination, and that's across 1,000 contacts. Now, no matter what you and I might claim is our practice, this is what is actually recorded. And to be honest, yes, there may be times when physical examination is done, but it's not adequately recorded. But we need then to improve our recording. And there are other concerns on this chart. For example, how often do we allow our patients to have a dental checkup whilst they're under our care? It's important, but only 20% are receiving that. Okay, let's come on to what a psychiatrist doing. What a psychiatrist doing regarding monitoring? In fact, I started off saying, is this the area which we can give to GPs, GP colleagues? So why don't I just quickly go over the GP data? Well, the definitive study on medical risk factor, cardiometabolic risk monitoring, has been done in the UK by Osborne. That's David Osborne, and he's conducted a study based on the Thin Network Primary Care Database, and it's 100,000 people, including 20,000 with SMI, so a very, very large study. And the data, it's going to be very difficult for you to see this at the back, but essentially, if you look at almost any parameter, BMI, um, this is just the BMI data divided by age, but lipids, hypertension, the rates of monitoring in primary care are very, very low prior to this being incentivized in the UK QOF system. So just to explain, in the UK we have a financial incentive for GPs to reach their targets. And that is um, a target, four of those targets are notated here, and I'll show you on the next slide. So, sorry, five of those targets. So five of those targets are BMI, um, B blood pressure, cholesterol, glucose, and a combination, a combination, you can add, add them all up, full monitoring. So Sheila Hardy, who's a nurse specialist in Northampton, sent me this initial data based on GP monitoring of patients with SMI, head-to-head -head with diabetes, using the same markers in the same period of time, in the same practices. Now you could say, well, why is it even fair to compare 
um, schizophrenia with diabetes. But the mortality gap in, between um, years of life lost is the, approximately the same in schizophrenia as it is from diabetes. Most deaths in schizophrenia are not from suicide, just as the same. Most deaths in diabetes, they're not due to diabetes, they're actually due to cardiovascular risk, usually myocardial infarction or stroke. There's a lot of similarities, I won't go through that slide in great detail for sake of time, but in my view it is a fair comparison to ask, are we monitoring equivalently? So based on that signal, which perhaps wasn't the largest study in the world, there were only 386 with SMI in that group, we expanded this to look at the national data. Now the national data in the UK was only available following the incentivization of these markers. So the off financial target had come in. So you have to expect, if you're going to give the GPs a financial target to monitor these things, it's going to be done pretty much as well as it could be done in any setting. So the result is all of these markers went up in recent years because of that financial incentive. But put the financial incentive to one side for a second. The question really is, is there still an inequality? Is there still an inequality in the measuring? And sure enough, it's the same inequality that we found before the COF target. And across the board, and now the sample size is really huge, this is everyone seen in primary care for the whole year, 2012, for the whole of the UK. 8 million people. Across 8 million people, 75% with SMI had um, cardiometabolic checks in each of these areas. That's uh, either HbA1c, blood pressure, cholesterol and BMI. And you can see the individual results are there. Uh, compared to 97% for diabetes who equivalently met that target. There is, a, there is a definite and large disparity between those. Now the first criticism I hear when I present this data is, okay, yeah, we, we accept there's a difference, but obviously the patients with schizophrenia are not turning up. That's the reason. It's not that they're not being offered. We've already removed non-attendance from this data. If you keep non-attendance in, yes, the disparity is even greater. But this is having removed non-attendance. These are attending patients. What monitoring did they receive? So the answer isn't actually wholly in non-attendance. Now we come on to the psychiatrists. So we reviewed this in a meta-analysis which was published in Psychological Medicine about a year ago. And what that showed is that we're not very good at monitoring these cardiometabolic risk factors. The things that we monitor more frequently are the very, very simple things that don't involve a blood test. Essentially weight or waste and possibly blood pressure. Those two are the only things that creep above 50% monitoring in psychiatric routine practice. If you look at lipid monitoring, um, it was 20% in the early 2000s, and in the last five years it's gone up to, at the most, 40%. So we're we are not good at monitoring. But there is a trend, there is a trend which is upwards, and that is because this area of cardiometabolic risk has become more and more of a headline of late. So there is a trend, and the, and the tipping point is said to be 2004, which is the ADA stroke APA guidelines, but other countries have had equivalent guidelines, and that has caused an increase. Now a key factor here is not necessarily whether something's detected, it's actually what are we doing about it? Are we doing anything about it when we find the problem? And this is a national UK audit of schizophrenia monitoring habits, which has recently been concluded in the UK. And all I want to bring your attention to are the red lines. Now the red lines say, if the problem is detected in that area, did somebody attend to the problem? So this is not a detection issue, it's a treatment issue. And you can see, if BMI is known to, found to be high in psychiatric practice, only in 70% of cases do we try to do anything about it. And believe me, this data is try to do something about it. It isn't the patient's problem resolved. It's did somebody try to do something. And at this end of the scale, if you have a lipid problem that's detected in psychiatric care, only on 20% of occasions do we try to do something about it. For example, refer to one of our colleagues in endocrinology. Uh, if you have a hypertension, then 25%, you can read. It's not very convincing. Let's look at smoking for one second. The smoking is relatively, it's a huge headline, but rel relatively straightforward to try to do something about. Not necessarily easy to resolve, I admit. We just looked at um, 
smoking cessation data. And I'll just pull out one paper of head-to-head -head studies on smoking cessation advice in schizophrenia compared to those without schizophrenia. And this one paper by Duffy actually shows that patients with schizophrenia were 0.69 as likely to receive smoking cessation advice on quitting as those without schizophrenia. Now surely our patients with the high risk of smoking should be receiving at least equal or maybe superior levels of advice on smoking in other areas. But here we find that they're receiving less adequate advice. And the last few slides are bringing you back to this orientation diagram. So we've done all these four areas, we've done monitoring now. Why, why have I put prescribed drugs here? Well, it may surprise you that if you suffer a myocardial infarction, or indeed if you have any cardiovascular problem and you have schizophrenia, your chances of, of receiving an appropriate cardiovascular medication are significantly less than if you don't have schizophrenia. And this, by significantly less, the odds ratio is 0.79. If you want to look up the confidence intervals in more detail, that paper is in the British Journal of Psychiatry from 2012. So that is about prescriptions. Now would you believe then that patients with schizophrenia, if they are indicated to have a surgical treatment, for example, a revascularization procedure following myocardial infarction, or maybe a surgical treatment for their cancer, bowel cancer. Do you think it's possible that, that surgeons might not be operating in the same way for our patients just by virtue of their condition? Well, let's have a look at the data. So this is, this is revascularization procedures, and there's actually quite a few studies. And this is any mental illness versus no mental illness, and this is schizophrenia versus no schizophrenia. Well, look, let's just look at this side. Now this is hazard ratio, which is two ratios, one divided by another. It's not the ratio of odds. So this, this actually means that in schizophrenia, patients are receiving 47% less procedures, revascularization procedures, following myocardial infarction. And that paper is in British Journal of Psychiatry, but there's a sister paper also in Journal of Psychopharmacology. Now what about surgery for cancer? Now, first of all, what is the, what is the chance of having surgery for cancer if you have cancer in, you, in the general population? Well, the answer is it's 98%. 98% receive a, an appropriate, usually surgical treatment for colorectal cancer. But look at this, if you have any one of those medical disorders, and by all means look this up yourself, Bellagion, this is a very, very good study. The sample size is half a million in this study. Published Journal of American Geriatric Society, 2011. But for the purpose of today, psychotic disorder, there's a six times relative risk compared to, the rel compared to two, on, or 98% at baseline, of not receiving appropriate surgical treatment. Yes, most still do, but what I'm saying is the relative risk is still very high. And the key issue here is that these inequalities do definitely affect mortality. And I'll just present that in two slides. Basically, there's one uh, author, Bergamon, who has controlled for the inequalities and showed that if you control for the inequalities, survival is actually the same. Whereas if you don't control for received care, there's an inequality in survival. In other words, after cancer, patients have a higher mortality if they have schizophrenia. But if you control for receipt of treatment, that difference disappears. And the exact same thing was found by Druss. Druss um, looked at our, uh, partly our data, which put into a meta-analysis. But what Druss did is he controlled for the received quality of care. And he found that mortality after myocardial infarction, which is 11% higher if you have schizophrenia, is no longer significant if you control for inequalities. So, summary of this part, which has gone over time, and I'm going to make up for that time on the second part, how you'll be pleased to know is that medical care is suboptimal in almost all areas. That um, medical inequalities in medical care are not wholly explained by non-attendance of the patient. That our, our own metabolic monitoring is relatively poor. And that this is contributing to mortality in our, in our patients. Okay, can we go through the second um, slide, please? 